Hello to everyone out there. Thank you so much for joining us for our Crafts Giving mini series. My name is Leah. I am your moderator today. Now, a couple things before we bring in today's instructor. First of all, Craftsy, the National Quilter Circle, and Creative Crochet Corner have all teamed up to provide a full week of live demonstrations and a bundle of five free fall themed patterns. Make sure to download your free patterns by clicking the link in the description. Once you get to the patterns page, make sure to click the picture of the project that you would like to download. Once you enter your email, you will immediately receive the free download. And every day this week, we've got a new instructor streaming live. We're quilting, sewing, crocheting, and cooking. And of course, we decorated some cookies too. So they will provide those step-by-step -step demonstrations of all of the fun projects that we have all week long. And what I am mostly here for is to keep an eye on your questions. So I have seen a couple comments already in our chat box. I'd like to draw your attention to that now. Uh, it's going to be the blue chat box or the chat on Facebook and YouTube. Any questions or comments that you have throughout today's session, I will keep an eye on those and ask them to our instructor as we cook through today's event. Uh, and then of course, if you have more general questions, feel free to drop those in as well. We always have time to get to at least a few of those. And with that said, it is time to bring our instructor forward. Today we have Robin Miller with us. Robin, people are already looking forward to the yummy recipe you have for us today. Thank you for joining us. Can you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and how is your day going so far? All right, so I'm, I'm looking in here and I'm thinking that it's possible that we may not have sound at the moment. Um, we can't hear Robin. I know our team is working on that right now. So I think while we're getting that sorted out, let me do a quick check. Can you hear me now? I can hear funny? you. Is I that think good? it sounds good yes um so everybody out there that was in the message box i hope that you can hear robin now as well uh so i guess robin, i'll start over i'm gonna have you repeat everything <laughs> you just said <laughs> that's right now we're gonna see if i was telling the truth because if i can repeat everything that i just said no so my, i first wanted to thank leah for because i love working with leah it's super fun and if you've seen us together before it's really fun we always have a good time and i'm super happy to be here celebrating this week of craftsy, craftsy giving, you know, holiday inspired ways to make the holidays fun, easy, entertaining, delicious and all that. Um, I'm doing a side dish today, but um, what I was gonna say is it's a simple one and that means I'm open for interaction with you. So the holidays for me is about the people as much as it is about the food. So I'd love for you to feel like you're sitting right here and ask me your questions, whether it has something to do with this side dish or maybe you're having unexpected guests or you can't find ingredients at the grocery store like I've been having issues with. Um, what can we do to make the holidays come together with ease and stress-free? Um, and for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm a food writer, nutritionist, cookbook author, and 
TV host. So I have two shows on Craftsy, Efficient Weeknight Cooking and Real Life Cooking. I do lots of live events and I have a Food Network show called Quick Fix Meals, which is streaming, stream, not screaming, I'm not screaming, streaming on Discovery Plus currently. So um, I would love to answer your questions. And I, again, I am a nutritionist. So if it's a nutrition related question, I'm here for you there too. Um, and I'll give it back to Leah to see how she wants to start because this is not going to take long to make this fabulous roasted Brussels sprout side dish. All right, I would just like to offer a reminder to everybody, especially those of you that may have joined just after the top of the hour. This is, like Robin just said, an interactive session. So she's going to do a live demonstration of the recipe. If you don't have your recipe, you can always go ahead and click the link in the description and you'll be able to get today's recipe for what Robin will be demonstrating for us. And of course, questions. We love them. Robin just asked you if, for whatever you want to put in. I would love to read them to Robin, so please, get your questions ready. Anything that has to do with what she's demonstrating right at the moment, I'll just jump in and get that question asked. But any more general questions, we'll hold and get to as many as possible when we have some time. So Robin, I'm going to send it to you okay. so you can get started with today's yumminess. Fantastic. Thanks, Leah. And thank you all again for, for being here. So I'm going to do a simple side dish. It's a, sort of a twist on a classic. I think Brussels sprouts are pretty popular during the holidays. But this recipe works with broccoli, with cauliflower, with green beans. So um, it's an oven roasted dish and it's my garlic Parmesan Brussels sprouts. And um, again, as, we're t as I'm doing this, I want to open up if you have questions about the turkey. If you watched the live show two hours ago or an hour ago, uh, we did chickens in case you can't find a turkey. I got a spare ham this year just in case um, little backstory you'll hear me talk about this but I have one son in college who's not going to come home for Thanksgiving because it's too far for such a short weekend so I have another son and I thought it would be weird if it was just like two or three of us so I told him to invite some friends and he invited pretty much everybody that he knows so I am having more of an open house situation so it's going to be non-traditional but I'm going to keep my favorite traditional dishes and hope they stay throughout the day. Um, people can come and go as they please. Maybe they'll come hungry, maybe they won't. Um, but so I'm kind of rolling with the punches this year. And if I have one piece of advice, not that you're asking for it, but it would be that. Because if you can't find an ingredient, maybe you make something else or you swap in something else. If you go from two people to 40 people, you know, I'm gonna try to adapt. Um, so that's why I got that ham in case the turkey that I was able to find doesn't stretch. Um, so I will just tell, talk to you about a step that already happened when you weren't here, and that was the blanching of these Brussels sprouts, because um, I think it's an important step. I know some of you are like, ugh, it's an extra step, but it really makes all the difference in the world. You take a pound, pound and a half, and it, my recipes are all easy to double, triple, or have, depending on your size of your uh, party that you need to serve. Um, but the recipe calls for a pound and a half of Brussels sprouts blanched. So that means that you just drop them right from the bag. And I handpick mine, but you can get them right next where they sell all the lettuce, packaged lettuces. They're usually there in those bags as well. Put it in boiling water, salt it if you want, four minutes, and drain. When they're cool enough to handle, which is where these are now, that's when we trim the ends and we have them. So there's a reason I do this, a couple reasons. Um, one is, I don't know if you've ever tried to roast Brussels sprouts raw, but there are two things that go on. First, the tender leaves tend to char before the center gets tender and uh, they're blackened. Yes, we want them caramelized, but we don't necessarily want them fringed and burned with that burnt taste. And then there's the sulfur quality of the sprouts, the cru all the cruciferous vegetables. When they roast, they tend to give off that sulfur aroma. And sometimes that gets into the flavor of the vegetable. So a quick blanch eliminates that problem. You need a shorter roasting time so the leaves won't fringe or burn. And, um, and you're guaranteed a crispy edge, ten tender middle, and no sulfur quality or aroma. So again, I do it with broccoli, and I do it with cauliflower, and I do it with sprouts. So I'm gonna have what's left. I left about 10. The rest of them are already ends trimmed and halved. So I'll just finish those. And Leah, if there's a question, bring it on. 
All right. Well, we do have a few in here. Uh, Cindy's is first. And Cindy wants to know, does the time change for a convection oven or can you use a combo setting microwave slash convection? Uh, so Cindy lives in an RV. So that's where this question is coming oh, from. Oh, that's great. So convection cooking, for those of you um, who, who don't know, it just it circulates the air around the food. So it's Eve, I swear by convection cooking. I used to not till I really tried it. Um, it, it's more even cooking and faster cooking. So yes, you would keep the oven temperature at 400 degrees, but check it a few minutes before most cooking times. Not just my recipe, all recipes, because it does tend to, foods do tend to cook faster, um, but definitely you get those beautiful caramelized edges around all sides. It's, um, you know, if you had another conventional ovens, Sometimes you'll see where it says halfway through, turn the baking sheet around or the roasting pan around and the convection oven kind of does that for you. So that's a great question. Um, and I love that you're gonna do it in an RV. See, we're all doing it in our own way this year. Here's, here's another tip while I'm thinking about it. So I had this cutting board down on the wood and it was sliding around. So wet paper towels underneath so you don't slip and cut yourself. That's no ERs on Thanksgiving. So you may have already known that, and maybe you have grippers on your cutting boards, but if you don't, get a wet towel under there, paper or cloth, and it won't slide. All right, let's do uh, another question here while you're doing that. Uh, this one's from Georgia. Georgia wants to know how long you blanched those for. The, uh, so the Brussels sprouts blanched for four minutes. The recipe says four minutes, three to four. Um, these are, I would say, medium size. If you find the Brussels sprouts tiny, then two to three. But these are, you know, pretty normal, robust size. There are, I don't know if you've seen lately, some of the Brussels sprouts are, you know, bigger than golf balls. So then you would go four to five. But four minutes, I have found across the board is great for Brussels sprouts. Two, uh, two to three, two for broccoli and three for cauliflower. If you're going to give them a quick branch and you're blanch and you're going to do this recipe with those uh, cruciferous veggies instead. And while we're talking adjustments for blanching, uh, Michelle wants to know what kind of adjustments you would make time-wise if you are making shaved sprouts instead of the full ones. Ah, oh, roasted shaved sprouts. Hmm. I would do 30 seconds. I, I, I wouldn't go any longer. And you know, another thing you could do instead of shaving, because it's a lot of work, um, it's just the leaves. So I've done a uh, roasted the leaves and turned it into a Caesar salad, which is fantastic. Um, but that just would take like 15 to 30 seconds to lock in the green color, soften the leaves a little bit and, and get them a head start so they don't require so much cooking in the oven. So I hope that answered the question, because I would think a shaved broccoli you could also do raw. You wouldn't even really need to roast that kind of a dish. I'll have to think about that one. It's a good question. I would All say right, you roast it for before, five minutes gonna, just to melt yeah, the cheese. Yeah, I'm going to let you continue before I feed you any more questions. Oh, we've got a <laughs> this is going to be ready in five minutes, I can tell you. Um, so the second ingredient is the garlic, and there's a couple options there. You can chop, mince, grate fresh garlic, which I'm going to do here. But I'm also a huge fan of not garlic powder, but the dehydrated minced garlic sold right next to the garlic powder in the grocery store. It's nutty. It's not overly garlicky. It doesn't burn when you're roasting. Um, and it's just a great pantry staple moving forward. If you're ever in the middle of a recipe, you know, ah, I don't have any garlic. You can pull the dried minced garlic out. It really kind of mimics fresh garlic as if you've also given it a quick saute or a quick toast. So that's a good backup for you to have in your, um, in your pantry. I always have it. And they have minced onion too. So that said, I have fresh garlic. So I'm gonna give it a quick smash and a uh, quick mince, and then Leah, that opens me up for listening. All right, let's, uh, let's go back to Betsy's question here. This is a more general question. So Betsy has a best friend who is a vegan and is coming to her family's Thanksgiving dinner. Do you have any dish recommendations uh, for people to add to the menu if you're hosting a vegan? Yes, I do. I have a lot of vegan followers and gluten-free gluten followers. And so for this dish, I don't know if you've ever if you've ever cooked vegan before or if you've um, 
tried. <laughs> it can be really easy because there's so many great flavors out there. So there is a uh, brewer's yeast that resembles Parmesan cheese, but you can make it even better, and you can Google this. Um, there is a vegan Parmesan cheese. You can buy, store buy it, or you can make it, and it's made with like toasted cashews and brewer's yeast, and I think a pinch of garlic or something, but I've done it before, and it totally works, and it would work here, and then the rest of this dish, yeah, it's vegan anyway, because I've just got olive oil and crushed red pepper flakes, and um, it's a lot easier to cook for our vegan friends these days and our gluten-free friends because the uh, supermarket has pretty much everything we need in the regular aisle, and you don't have to go to a specialty store or, or do online ordering these days. Okay, do you have time for one more? Oh, lots of time. Perfect. We're going to go back to the Brussels sprouts, our main theme today. Uh, so Christina wants to know, um, has put up Brussels sprouts earlier this year. So how about using them frozen? What kind oh. of difference is with that? Make? Yes, so absolutely, you can use them frozen. I have a little tip in the recipe when you get to it that says if you're starting with frozen, just blanch for one minute. That's it, because they've already been kind of flash frozen and they're softened a little bit anyway. So they're much softer going into the process than fresh off the vine, fresh from the produce section. So yeah, just, just go about a minute, minute and a half on that blanche and um, proceed as directed. And right, if, you're, if you're looking for a time saver, while the Brussels sprouts are cooling, that's when you can do the garlic because right out of the pot, they're too hot to handle. So um, if you're, I always try to look for maximum efficiency <laughs> and multitasking. So uh, these, the broccoli, the um, Brussels sprouts will be boiling while I was doing this right here in, a, in my uh, home kitchen. <laughs> now let's go the complete opposite direction. For people that are pulling these Brussels sprouts right out of the garden, yes. how would you change the preparation for the blanching? So this, this is assuming these are right out of the garden. So trim mm -hmm. The trim so they get the way you would look at the grocery store, and then if you found them at the grocery store, and then proceed as directed four minutes, and then, uh, and by the way, it's so much easier to trim and have them when they're blanched. So the stem end comes off quickly, and they have without leaves, fl you know, flying everywhere. So it really is a it's a multi useful step to give them that quick blanch, but. Yes, proceed as if this recipe was written for fresh out of the garden or fresh from the produce section of the grocery store. All right, I'm going to give you Mamie's question next. Okay. Mamie's wondering when you're using honey or balsamic vinegar, is yes. it better to drizzle on afterwards or is it better to roast with it? So in general with all recipes, the honey balsamic. So, it dep so I have a couple of thoughts there. Honey, honey burns, so it depends what you, how long it's gonna be in the oven. Um, it will burn over time and always, and I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, but have a parchment paper under there when you're roasting or baking with sugar, so honey, brown sugar, and balsamic glaze. Um, uh, for me, I do a little of both. So I do a little in the beginning before roasting so the flavors seep into whatever it is, everything from a sweet potato to a vegetable to a chicken. And then at the end, uh, before serving, I like to drizzle with a little bit more honey and balsamic glaze, which you can buy now in the grocery store already made for you, um, or you can just take equal parts balsamic brown sugar and simmer it until it's syrupy, um, boiled down till it reduces till it's syrupy. So for me, it's both. You get that fresh, um, vibrant kick of the balsamic and the sweetness of the honey before serving, I mean, right before serving. And then the roasted softens the balsamic's tanginess and sweetens the honey because it caramelizes. So I hope that answered that question. And now she have to use it twice, but. <laughs> yes, I would think so. Um, if you're still curious about more details, drop that into the chat box as well. We can always revisit this. Yeah, uh, yeah for because now, this is beyond Brussels sprouts. These questions can go anywhere because. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the holidays and we all need help. <laughs> all right, Robin, I'm gonna let you go on a little bit more before okay. feeding you some more questions. So drop them in the chat okay. box if you're not to them. So this, um, so I just dumped those two, two and a half cloves of garlic right in with the blanched Brussels sprouts, a little bit of olive oil to coat. So if you're reducing this recipe or 
doubling or tripling it. You really just want a sheen. You don't, these don't need to be oily. We just want them coated. Um, and a good quality olive oil would be nice to get that great flavor. But you really just want them uh, to have a sheen, not drippy with oil. And the olive oil not only adds flavor, it helps create the crisp leaves, and it helps the Parmesan cheese that I'm going to add cling to every inch of these sprouts. So, okay, so that's in there. Now I'm just gonna do some salt and pepper. If you have freshly ground, I have salt and pepper mixed together in here. So it's a one-stop shop. Um, you can use pink salt, gray salt, flaked, you know, whatever you have. Um, and if you have those fancier salts, definitely finish at the end. And you know, to go, uh, we had the vegan question. If you wanted to go the other direction, uh, bacon would be amazing in here. And I um, would give it a little sizzle first to its chewy crisp and add about four slices chopped up in here right now before it roasts, before it finish and roasts. Okay, so that's nice and tossed. See that? Nice and shiny. And see how green? So the, the other thing about roasting is it locks in that green flavor. So you've, I mean that green color, the vibrancy. So it won't get pallid. And then you need about a half a cup of grated Parmesan cheese. And I'll take a moment to talk about the Parmesan cheese. So uh, don't be afraid of grating your own Parmesan cheese. It, you get so much more flavor, or even if you find the freshly grated in the refrigerated section of your grocery store, it's great, it's better. It's got more flavor, fewer additives, because it does, is there's, you don't need anti-caking agents if it's gonna sit shelf stable. Um, and there's plenty of domestic Parmesans now that taste fantastic. You don't need to spend a lot of money. I got a wedge the other day for under $5, I think, at most my grocery stores, domestic Parmesan. Um, put it side by side. We thought it was great, freshly grated or freshly shredded. It really can make a difference and if it's not going to break the bank, I think you'll notice a difference too, especially in a dish like this where it's kind of going to shine. It's one of the star players. We only have parm, garlic, and Brussels sprouts really, so um, uh, it really, uh, the flavor will really help. It'll be nutty, just enough salty, and it'll caramelize beautifully. Isn't that pretty? Oh my gosh. You could eat this right now, by the way. You don't even need to roast it. This could just go right to the table since they're blanched. Okay, Leah, question? <laughs> All right. First, I'm actually going to point out, we did have a question come in from Gail. Gail, it's, this is a frequently asked question. Will this be available to watch later? Yes, it will. And our fantastic behind the scenes team, I brag about them all the time. They actually dropped the link to where you can find these live events later. So anything that Robin says you want to revisit at another time, you can come right back here and watch it. Uh, I actually want to have, Robin, you mentioned blanching again, and there are a couple questions about it. So if you could actually describe the blanching process. Yes. Uh, it's like Sarita wants to know what it means, and okay. Diana wants to know, do you put them in cold water after you are done blanching? That's so funny. Um, and this just reminded me, my son and I were sitting at the table last week. He's a senior in high school, and he's taking a course where, I don't know, he learns, he said, um, do you know what? shocking means and i was like in terms of cooking and i said yes it's plunging something in ice water for an ice water bath and it's funny that you know and he was like yes and i got it right so um it blanching is and so it's funny because i looked it up because there was another question that his textbook i thought was incorrect um, blanching is the boiling step so blanching is when you drop fruits, vegetables, whatever, in boiling water for a certain amount of time. And the shocking step is to then immerse that food in an ice water bath to stop further cooking. So the Brussels sprouts stop cooking and whatever else you're doing is to shock it. Like what happens, oh, it's great with asparagus because you know asparagus goes from vibrant green to kind of pale yellow really fast. In this case, I don't shock it. Um, we're only doing four minutes and then we're roasting. So I'm only doing the blanching step to lock in the flavor and, and to give a head start so we don't need to, to cook too long in the oven. But that is what blanching is. It's just basically boiling. Boiling 
quickly, getting it in, getting it out. So if you're starting with the frozen Brussels sprouts, that's 30 seconds. If you're starting with asparagus, that's 30 seconds. It's just a in and out. And if your recipe calls for shocking, which is the ice water bath after, do it because it's usually necessary for, for things, you know, green beans, snap peas, because they will continue to cook even though they're out of the water. I hope that helped. Did that make sense? <laughs> Yes, I okay. think that was very helpful. If we have any more questions about that, I'll slide those in as well. Um, but there's a more general question here that I think will be helpful for quite a few viewers. So this is Betsy's question. Betsy wants to know how long Brussels sprouts stay good in the fridge before cooking them, because Betsy is trying to decide when the grocery shopping should happen. Yes. Um, are you doing your, if you're doing your grocery shopping for next Thursday, mm -hmm. you can get them this weekend. So. I already purchased my potatoes and my sweet potatoes. I'm holding off on the Brussels sprouts. Well, because we're not going to serve these. <laughs> I'm holding off on the broccoli, the Brussels sprouts, uh, and all the fresh herbs until Sunday or Monday for me. So I would say three to five days. Because, um, uh, and, and if you have a full refrigerator, that's good too. So rather, it's better to have a full refrigerator than a half empty one. Uh, then the uh, everything just stays colder. Same with your freezer. So if you could load up on your veggies uh, that day, um, and you know to keep your apples away from your other produce because it makes it ripen and uh, mature faster. So I don't know if that's a factoid that everyone knows, <laughs> but my apples are far away from everything else because of the ethylene gas that they emit. Um, just kind of gets everything to to over ripen too quickly. So okay, I hope have, that answers. Yeah, we have a few more questions. Would you like me to ask you a few more? Or yes, do you want because this is pretty much going into the oven. So I was just going to tell you that I, when I do this, I know it's an extra step. I turn them all flesh side up. So the, um, the bottom gets a little crispy and the top gets golden brown. So I'm just going to be here flipping Brussels sprouts and answering questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds good. We've got one from Wendy next then. Uh, Wendy says, hi, Robin. Hi, Wendy. What, what will go well with these? Brussels sprouts are not typically in our traditional Thanksgiving, but there are so many dinner parties around this time. What would you say uh, when oh. you're creating a menu with this as a side dish? Oh, so this is not going to be for Thanksgiving. Oh, my gosh. I, I could think of a million things. Um, roasted, uh, you know, steak a great steak, whether it's been, you know, grilled or pan seared. Um, so this has got, so if you know, the, think about what you would pair broccoli with. So pretty much anything, chicken breast, seafood, steak, pork chops. Um, Cause we've got, what we've got going on here is that cruciferous vibe with nutty Parmesan cheese and garlic. So pretty much anything goes, um, you could do a nice salmon on the side with a you know a nice sweet glaze so when i think about my menu i think about the elements and having them co contrast and complement each other at the same time so if i've got salty nutty here i might want something sweet like a uh, teriyaki salmon on the side or a, a steak with caramelized onions so we've got something sweet to go with the something salty. So I kind of envision my plate as a bunch of different flavors coming together. So I hope that helps, because I think it really, yes, it's great for Thanksgiving, but I make this all year. And um, my kids were not Brussels sprouts fans before I started doing it this way. So. Ooh, that leads <laughs> right to our next question. This comes <laughs> husband hates the taste of Brussels sprouts. Yeah. So Betsy was actually wondering if you had other favorite vegetable options for Thanksgiving. I know you talked about some substitutions for this recipe, yes. but what else would come to mind for you? Yeah, so right out of the gate, broccoli for sure. And by the way, you could do half the sheep pan broccoli and half the sheep pan Brussels sprouts, and he could try one. And then if he doesn't <laughs> like it, he's got the broccoli back up. So you could do that. I've done that many times with my kids. But for sure, broccoli would work here, cauliflower florets, green beans. Um, I've done it with snap peas, even though I often take an Asian turn when I'm doing snap peas and snow peas. Um, but it does work with that as well, if he likes those. Um, frozen green beans, if you've got those. And what I love about it is you could do half, you really could do half and half or four different veggies in the same style, garlic and parm. 
you know, if you think about it, what doesn't work with garlic and farm, right? So a lot of different vegetables work. I agree with that. Garlic and parm on everything. <laughs> All day long. <laughs> now, Jean and Kathy are kind of of the same mind with this next question. And this is about when you start to blanch. Yes. You're talking about the timing, 30 seconds to four minutes. When does that time start? When you put oh. the spray into the water or when the water comes to a boil again? That's a great question. And that's really going to help people that are doing having or doubling this recipe. Great question. So um, the answer is when the water comes back up to a boil. So that could be immediately if you half this recipe and you've got three quarters of a pound of Brussels sprouts, you put them in. It's like, I mean, and it depends on your stove. So some, some folks have, you know, lots of heat and others it takes a while to come back up to a boil. So start that timer when it comes back up to the boil. Same with pasta. Um, so yeah, definitely. And if you're concerned about overdoing it, pull them out early because you can finish in the oven, these won't burn, that's the whole point. So if you're concerned about overdoing it, then underdo it. Um, I kind of don't mind. I, I can take vegetables super soft or a little bit crisp. That's, that, I'm okay in that pendulum. Um, but if you're worried about having something that's overdone, I don't believe these would ever get mushy, but broccoli will. So um, when in doubt, pull it out of the water sooner on the early side of, of any window that you see in the recipe. Okay, that, I think that will help a lot of people. We've got a lot of yeah. blanching questions today. Yeah, um, I'm glad I brought up blanching then because, and it's so funny this happened to be a topic where I was talking about my son because I think there is, there is misconception. Why aren't you just calling it boiling then? It, well, it basically is. And some folks will say, like and some chefs will say, you have to salt the water. Um, I tend to not salt the water, I tend to salt once it's out. Um, but again, that's really a matter of personal taste. The salt keeps the temperature of the water, high, the boiling higher, so it tends to boil. Um, it, it won't drop, the temperature won't drop as much when you put the veggies in. It'll come back up to boil quicker. So you just throw a little teaspoon of, of salt in there too. And that will help keep the boiling level quicker and consistent. And season the veggie at the same time. <laughs> All right, this so, is revisiting a little bit of something that you'd already talked about uh, with Catherine's question coming up next. Catherine cannot eat Parmesan. So can nutritional yeast or something else be subbed in? Do you want to talk a little bit more about that option? Yes. So when we were when I answered the vegan question, I was talking about that nutritional yeast, which I think tastes like nutty Parmesan cheese. And that is the base of a lot of the vegan cheeses that you'll find, the vegan Parmesan cheeses that you'll find at the grocery store. And if you wanna make your own, then you use the nutritional yeast. And I may have said brewers, I meant nutritional yeast, I don't remember what I said earlier, but I meant nutritional yeast. Um, and there's a great uh, vegan parm that I have made with toasted cashews, nutritional yeast, and I think a little bit of garlic. And it was really good. I did a vegan stuffed mushrooms, which, you know, stuffed mushrooms are, are Parmesan cheese, all kinds of, you know, flavors, but Parmesan cheese is, is a strong flavor and, stuffed mushrooms and I made them vegan with this uh, nutritional yeast cashew garlic concoction and it was really good really good my mouth's watering a little bit <laughs> <laughs> all right well I've reached the end of the questions that we have for now okay but they've been coming in a uh, pretty rapid fire once they start coming in so go okay. ahead and the chat box with more questions and we're going to watch Robin cook a little more. Well, I'm pretty much there. So I was just going to mention that um, if you, when, when you see the picture of this finished dish, because I'm, I'm just going to let you finish it at home, but I do have pictures of it. Um, you'll see that it's in a casserole dish. So you can do a shallow casserole dish. You could even do a roasting pan. If that's what you have, that works too. I did a sheet pan. Yeah, there's the picture. And look how the cheese melts. And you can see that little nugget of garlic. And some of the leaves are, you got that little crispy edge there. Um, but look at the vibrant green. Uh, it, many, many roasted uh, Brussels sprouts recipes I see, they're just blackened and charred. And that can be quite bitter. So if you are going to use a baking sheet, yeah, so that's the that's one of my, I think that's um, a nine by 13 shallow roasting pan, something that you would do scalloped potatoes in or something. And look, I spilled a little crushed red pepper flakes. So that's what I was gonna say. Serving, I do crushed red pepper flakes 
on the side. So not everybody's going to want that heat. I think it's a great partner for the cheese. As I mentioned, I like to partner um, flavors, contrast, and complement. Um, but not everybody's going to want that. So over the holidays, especially if you have little ones um, at the table. So I always serve the crushed red pepper flakes on the side just before serving. So when you pull this from the oven, eight to 10 minutes, 400 degrees, sprinkle with or not, serve it on the side. If you're gonna use a baking sheet, just for cleanup, really, I, uh, I swear by parchment paper, I like to buy these pre-cut. I buy them in bulk, because I do all my roasted potatoes and veggies and chicken and fish and everything on parchment paper. So you just pick up the paper and go. It's clean, easy cleanup. Um, and I've just noticed that, because I like to give a lot of food gifts for the holidays, and last year I didn't because it seemed, well, we couldn't really. Um, but I've noticed that parchment paper makes a great wrapping paper for food. So banana breads and cookies and scones and things that are homemade. It folds up so nicely like you're, you know, into a little pouch and then you just put a bow on it. And it makes a super gift from home, from your kitchen, which maybe this year is, you know, going to be really appreciated since we're all in this together. <laughs> um, so yes, this goes in 400 degrees, eight to 10 minutes, um, and then serves. Prep ahead tip, if anybody wants one, because I love to have everything finished by Wednesday for Thanksgiving. So um, I usually do a race in the morning and I like to have everything kind of finished when I get back. So this can be prepped and looking like this uh, up like Tuesday and then just pull it from the fridge a couple minutes, maybe while the oven's preheating and bake it as directed. So this can, you can get it to this point um, 24 hours, 48 hours before baking. And then you can just bake and serve. All right, well, let's do Donna's question here next. Uh, going back to the cheese topic. So Donna yes. doesn't like any kind of cheese. So okay. what would you suggest for something like that? So I would assume that also means the nutritional yeast option might also be out because the taste profile is pretty yeah. similar. Well, yes, I, I mean, because I, I do think it tastes very much like, so if it's a dairy thing, then you could go the nutritional yeast route. If it's a flavor thing, I say bacon, right? I say we turn it and go to the more traditional bacon um, and then sprinkle the top with some caramelized onions. That would be great. Um, you could even do the crispy oven onions that you usually put on the green beans, or you could just caramelize some red onion um, and toss the bacon, as I mentioned before, put the bacon in, that's cooked until it's still a little chewy, finish it in the oven with the Brussels sprouts and then sprinkle with some caramelized onion on top. Maybe that, or would that work instead of cheese? <laughs> I think that would work. <laughs> and that's like paleo, right? <laughs> Keto and paleo and it's got, um, that would fit a lot of different dietary restrictions and um, trends. Now we have a question here from Cindy. You've talked a lot about different kinds of vegetables, but what about carrots? What do you have to say about carrots? It's so funny. I felt so bad. I was leaving carrots out. I was thinking of it, but I didn't want to say it because I don't think it works here. I have other recipes for carrots um, that I think would make them shine better because I think carrots look best and taste best when they're glossy and glazed. And this isn't a glossy glazed situation. It's a nutty, crumbly, caramelized. And so something like carrots, I like to do with maple syrup and brown sugar and, and uh, Dijon, or I go Asian and do a soy or a hoisin or something like that, sesame seeds. So when I think of a carrot, a show-stopping carrot dish, it's shimmering, right, in some kind of a glaze. And I think, no offense, but you're not welcome here. <laughs> <laughs> but you're perfectly welcome everywhere else. But you can try it. But in, in my house, I think I'll probably going to be. Do, I'll probably stick to my maple glazed carrots. All right. Well, let's talk again about the cheese here. So Joyce wants to know about the timing of adding the parmesan before roasting in yes. this recipe. So Joyce usually adds it at the end. Uh, what's right. the reason? And the reason we are adding it is because we did that first cooking step of blanching. So the Parmesan cheese will not burn, but you're right. If you're starting with raw Brussels sprouts, um, you get them in 
They probably roast for 10 or 15 minutes. Then you'd toss with Parmesan and finish them for the last eight to 10, five to 10, keeping an eye on it. But um, because we don't have to cook the Brussels sprouts through, they're already gonna be halfway there. We're just going for crispy edges, toasty cheese, soft centers, um, and a little toasted garlic too. So the garlic will toast in there. We're not looking for full on roasting them from start to finish so the cheese won't burn. And if you're doing the nutritional yeast option with the cashew or whatever nutritional yeast, same thing, it goes in because we're not cooking that long. So it can go in um, right at the beginning. Oh, perfect. All right, hopefully that was a helpful tip for the reasoning behind that. Maybe people can <laughs> add on to other recipes that they do as well. Yeah. Uh, let's talk parchment paper now. Diana wants to know if the parchment paper is necessary to roast. No, it's, it's a purely cleanup issue. That's it. It's not necessary to roast at all. In fact, if you wanted to do this in a, you know, a shallow baking dish, like the pictures of this finished dish, I just, um, and the recipe will tell you to coat the bottom with cooking spray or a thin sheen of olive oil or vegetable oil, but this is purely so you don't have to clean up. Ooh, we have some more general questions starting okay. to pop. Now. Millie's got a good one. I think for a lot of people, uh, you had mentioned at the beginning, Robin, that some different traditions may be starting this year. So yeah. for any that is stuffing a turkey, perhaps for the first time, Millie wants to know if you have tips on stuffing a turkey safely. Yes, I do. And I'm glad you're gonna do the tradition. I stopped tuffing, st tuffing, stuffing. Um, <laughs> A few years ago, it's funny, breaking tradition, I have kids that don't like change. Um, so I always had a little stuffing and then the dressing on the side. But for safety, do not stuff the bird, for clean, clean the cavity, salt and pepper the cavity, make sure um, it's really rinsed out clean and not, and the water runs clear when you rinse it, if you know what I mean. Um, then pat it dry and stuff the bird just before cooking no sooner. I don't know how, my grandmother stuffed the bird the night before, I don't know how n no one, how we all survived. You are, because the t stuffing temperature, it's hard for it to reach the temperature of safety. Definitely stuff the bird right before you roast it and don't overpack it in. So you wanna leave some room for all of it to get hot. And for the best chance of, of no risk, Use an instant read thermometer when you pull the turkey out. You're testing the turkey for doneness anyway, right? You're looking for 165 or 180, depending on how you like. I think the 185 for the legs. Um, that should be at least 140. The stuffing should be at least 140 degrees or higher. If it's not, you have to either take it out and bake it separately or put the bird back in until it reaches that temperature. Because that's, that's a culprit for food poisoning is often undercooked stuffing. Ooh. I wish you could have seen my face right when you mentioned that too. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and it's funny because my, my dad was, well, I grew up like that and she stuffed the bird the day before. And, but we just, we know more now. <laughs> and so it's, we, we, ha we have some rules. <laughs> All right, well, let's move through the Thanksgiving meal a little piece by piece with these next couple of questions. Great. So Diana, I believe Diana's question is about today's recipe. Uh, so Diana, if it's otherwise, you can drop a little clarification in as well. But Diana wants to know if you could pre-cook and then serve this later. So you said you could keep it back and roast it right before you yeah. serve it. Can you do the cooking? It's so early. I'm guessing then... you're worried about oven space, which we all, mm -hmm you know, juggle, if you're thinking about it for Thanksgiving. Um, you can, I, I would still prefer if you could just get it in for one minute before serving, but yes, you can. I mean, you could even serve at room temperature. So worst case, not even worst case, it would still be fine. You could pre-cook it um, and serve at room temperature or, or warm. If you wanna pre-cook it and wait till the next day, I would prefer if you just gave it a quick to five minutes at 350 degrees to get it warm all the way through again. But I mean, I've eaten this cold. So um, it really, anything works, but it really, it really shines when it's warm and toasty. All right, let's get past the main dishes and talk a little bit about dessert. So Tessa wants to know, what are your favorite desserts to make <laughs> for the home? 
Um, well, I make the traditional pumpkin pie, but I mine's different out of necessity. So I'm allergic to egg yolks, and you know pumpkin pie has eggs. So I make mine, and the funny thing is, it's everyone says it's their favorite, but I just make it with egg whites. So it's light and fluffy, and um, it's not heavy at all. And in fact, some years I've taken that filling and just baked it in little um, ramekins and served it without the crust, and I just called it pumpkin pie pudding or something, or mousse. Um, but yeah, it's light and fluffy, and it's, it's not heavy at all. And this year, because I may have a lot of people, I am going to do an apple pie. Not traditional for me. I'm adding it this year. And before we went live, I was thinking, gosh, if I do have a bunch of teenagers, I can't just have two pies. Um, so I'm starting to think of other things that I really love to do for the holidays, which is fudge. I have a one bowl fudge that you, it's sweet and condensed milk, semi-sweet chocolate, vanilla, and that's it, unless anything else you want to stir in there. I've done s'mores with graham crackers and marshmallows. I've just nuts. I've done cranberries. I've left it solid. So um, that's one stop, and I love to give that as gifts. And chocolate covered, well, maybe I'll do the chocolate covered pretzel rods. Those are always a big hit because you can put them in vases around, and they make a great, uh, like, table centerpiece um, and dessert, and they're healthy. So. All right, let's talk about menu prep. Uh, okay. Jen wants to know if you have dish ideas for a smaller gathering. So Jen is having her parents over for Thanksgiving and is still planning her menu. So what do you think? Yeah, well, if, you're, if, if turkey is on your menu, turkey tenderloin is great, or a turkey breast, if you are okay with that. I mean, that's what my mom started doing when we all moved out because there was just too much turkey and nobody was eating the dark meat but her. <laughs> so um, if you don't have dark meat fans, I say the turkey tenderloin or the turkey breast. Or if you watched the live show at 12 Central where we did that little twist on Thanksgiving, there was roasted chicken, which is always an option. It's still a roasted bird. You can still do all the sides. Um, I do tend to overdo it. So um, you know, I, I, I say maybe not two different types of potatoes. Maybe you pick one or do two small, like a, because, you know, there's a lot of starch and that will probably go to waste. So a small sweet potato dish, a small baked or mashed potato dish, and maybe one vegetable and um, an easy dessert that you can freeze leftovers. So a pie is hard to freeze, but if you made scones or cookies or, um, some kind of a snackable cake that you could then enjoy in the morning. So I was trying to think of ways to, you know, if you're having house guests, you also have to deal with breakfast the next morning. So um, something that maybe you could, that could evolve into breakfast toasted in the morning, like a, a banana bread or a pumpkin bread or pumpkin spice loaf or something like that could make a dessert and breakfast. Ooh, this brings us pretty close to Kelsey's question next. So Kelsey wants to know if you have any recommendations for using the Thanksgiving leftovers, you know, if we get too carried away. If we get too carried away. Well, I, I, I like to plan for leftovers. If you guys watch any of my shows, you know that I like kind of will double the chicken. So I have chicken tomorrow. Um, and I, so I always get a big bird on Thanksgiving. So I have lots of leftover turkey. And I try, there's the traditional turkey noodle soup with the egg noodles and all the vegetables that you can pull from your freezer or from the day before. Um, but I love thinking outside the box, like uh, whether it's turkey or ham, we do, I do lots of burritos, street tacos, a lot of stuff goes into scrambled eggs and then rolled into a tortilla and baked like an enchilada, breakfast enchilada. Um, I've done, um, stews so you know instead of a chili now we have turkey chili with black beans and all those warming chili cumin any bell peppers we have lying around everything goes into that pot because um, isn't it usually a big weekend of game watching so it's nice to have a big hearty stew of something and a big chunk of bread maybe a salad and use up all those all those um, leftovers and with mashed potatoes i've made gnocchi which is actually not that hard because all you need is the leftover mashed potatoes and egg or egg yolks and cheese, and then you form it into little pasta, and that's super great. Um, leftover m mashed sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes can become a pie or become, um, you know, you can put them on sandwiches. So there's so many different ways to repurpose, and you have about three days to enjoy that before um, you have to toss it. So there's lots of options. <laughs> 
Okay. We have time for a few more questions and we do have a few of them. So we'll see what we can get through here. Okay. Uh, Helen next. Helen says, I would love to get my kids involved in the kitchen. Yes. They are eight and 10. Do you have any tips maybe for this recipe, but also in general? Yes. So I loved getting my, now mine are 18 and 19, but I remember when they were when they were that age. And so to get them into the kitchen, to get them curious, and I wanted to have good eaters, not picky eaters. So I thought if they got in and they saw what it was, where it was coming from, and got their hands in it, they would try more things. And it, it, it worked, I mean, they would pick up garlic and onions. I remember a couple times they tried that, didn't do that again. Um, but to get them in and help, so I would bring in their little um, kid safes, those Fiskar scissors that you send them off to school with. Those are great for um, snipping herbs so they can help there. The kids love whisking things. Um, you know, if there's not raw eggs, if you're not worried about them licking their fingers, they can do the cake batter. They can scoop cookies. Um, I do think that when kids are involved in the cooking process, they are better eaters. They're less picky. They're not confused. They know what it is. It's not a surprise. Um, and now that my kids are older and the one is out cooking for himself every once in a while when the, he doesn't eat in the dining hall, um, he kind of knows what he's doing. He can put something together and it makes me feel good that he's, he's going to be all right, <laughs> knock on wood, um, but he can put together a meal, kind of knows the basics of flavors that go together um, and how much to do. So I think it's really cool. And those are the best moments too, when your kids are in the kitchen. Those are the stories you remember. That's when you're, you know, there's no pressure to say, how was school today? And it's just, you're not, you know, that's when the best conversations tend to happen, I think. So I hope, I hope it works out for you. Start with those little scissors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do Ellie's question next. Ellie wants to know if you have beverage ideas for a signature oh. cocktail or something else fun. What do you think? For um, the holidays? That's good. Um, I think sangrias are beautiful. So I didn't actually taught a sangria class at one point last year or two years ago. Um, and there's so many different types. You can do a white wine sangria, red wine sangria. And there's, if you Google, there's so many different types and they just are stunning. And most people seem to like them. And if they want to cut back on the alcohol, they can have half and some um, seltzer water. Um, that seems to be a crowd pleaser. And then, um, you know, depending on time of day, I love like a Bloody Mary bar. So you've got the, the, the vodka and then tomato juice and then all the different ways to make it the way you want. So you could have everything from olives and jalapenos and celery to um, seasoned, chili seasoned salt, um, uh, to Worcestershire sauce, Tabasco sauce, any other hot sauce. So th those are super fun to cut, like custom make cocktail bar. And you could probably do that with Manhattan, with um, martinis. Uh, I think people like to kind of make make their own cocktails if they have all the stuff in front of them. It's just fun. It's just an idea. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, if you have suggestions as a viewer, you can drop yes, some of please. them. Yes, please, because I don't know what I'm doing yet. Although last week I did do a nice um, batch of, of cider spiked. Well, so there was cider with cinnamon sticks and cloves and lemon. I had that simmering on my stove. And then if you wanted to add rum, you could. Otherwise, the kids could just have the hot cider. So that was really good. And this time of year, in some places, it's quite cold. <laughs> and it, was, uh, it just was really good. So you could add rum or not. I added the rum. <laughs> right. Oh, let's get to Claire's question here. Uh, I think we have time for one, maybe two more. Uh, Claire wants to know, what about trying this recipe with beets? How long Ooh. would we How hmm. long would so, uh, with the beets, I would, because I'm, I'm trying to think about what's going to be less messy, because um, with the beets, I wouldn't really change too much here. I would definitely blanch them, wear gloves, do, and then do, don't change anything really. Just trim the ends of the, the beets, blanch them as instructed, wear gloves to peel and have them, and then proceed as directed. You probably need less olive oil too. So just a drizzle. You just want them shiny. You don't want them oily. And then I would think you could do the Parmesan or you could wait and do feta over top. So then you'd have the sweet and the salty feta or goat, crumbly goat, I think would be amazing and colorful and, and super pretty. Um, and then maybe some fresh 
oregano or basil, parsley on top would be really pretty. I might do that now. Thank you for that suggestion. <laughs> All right. I really like this as a last question. So one of our YouTube viewers would like a review of what the temp is to bake the tray that you've created and for how long. And this is a great way to zoom in on that beautiful tray so that we can oh. leave with wonderful, wonderful recipe that we just got to see Robin together for yeah. us. So. And plus you have the finished. Can So here's the tray right before it goes into a 400 degree oven for eight to 10 minutes. Um, early on in this, in this live, we had a question about convection. So if you're doing convection, start checking at five minutes. Um, and then anywhere between five and 10 at 400 degrees, you're gonna have beautiful crispy edges, nutty cheese. There we go, let me get that in there for you. Where are you? There we go. Um, and uh, the finished dish is perfect. And if you wanna sprinkle the crushed red pepper flakes over top, it really does add a nice, I can even do it here. It adds that nice pop of color. You see that? See how the red really just kind of the colors complement so well. Um, and it's just, a, it's a pretty festive holiday dish. So yeah, that's the technique. That's the, and there you go, there's the finish. So I love how you can see that the Parmesan, although it doesn't, um, it doesn't melt like other cheese, it melts enough. And you can see how it coats the leaves of the Brussels sprouts. Yeah, and I love that it's in that white dish. So. Oh, it looks really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, and that's well, not um, the magic of television, that's real. Yeah, <laughs> it's a green color. Uh, Robin, I'd like for you to finish us off with any final thoughts you have before I give my final reminder. So okay. what do you want to end this off with? Well, I'm just, I mean, I know this was the least complicated recipe you've ever probably come to Craftsy for, but the whole point was that you can still throw something elegant out there even though it only requires three, four ingredients and minimal time. So it's really about getting a, a pretty delicious and um, gorgeous dish to the table with minimal effort. That's kind of what I'm always going for. And across the board, I try to do that with, uh, with all the dishes for Thanksgiving. So just was hoping this would take some stress out of it. Have you excited for the holidays? Whatever that might mean for you this year. I know mine's gonna be very different. And, um, but, and, and yours maybe too, but we're gonna embrace it and we're gonna um, enjoy it, wh wh who we can be with when we can and, and break bread together. Uh, and I wish you a great holiday. And also I might as well throw it out there. I mentioned a lot of recipes. My website, Robin Miller Cooks, they're all, they're all there. The fudge, the breads, whatever. If I said something too quickly, um, it's either Craftsy or Robin Miller Cooks. I've got, I've got it all there. All right. Well, thank you so much for this demonstration, Robin. I have a couple of reminders for all of our viewers before we officially say goodbye. And the first one is if you haven't visited the chat box yet, even if you didn't have a question, uh, there is a link that has been dropped in that you might be interested in. You can enter to win a Bake Like a Pro sweepstakes, and that link is there for you. So you can go ahead and check that out. You'll also find a link to Robin's website in there as well if you don't feel like searching for it. Uh, so that will be right in the chat box for you. And then, of course, if you're making this recipe or any of the crafts from this week, we would love for you to use a very specific hashtag so we can collect all of those and see it as a community on social media. And that hashtag is share craftsy. So anything that you want to take a photo of and share, hashtag it with share craftsy so we can all see it and enjoy a little bit of teamwork and crowdsourcing. And then finally, I would love for you to join us tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be our final day of our Craftsgiving mini series, and we will be streaming live tomorrow with Brenda Anderson. We're going to start that at 2 p.m. Central Time, and Brenda is going to have a live demonstration on making the crochet maize beanie. You can download your free pattern right now using the link in the description before tomorrow's event, and you can find the entire mini series schedule in the video description because, of course, like I said, you can always come back and rewatch these even after we say goodbye. Goodbye. So with that said, my name is Leah. On behalf of Robin and everybody on the team, thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to see you the next time. Happy crafting. <laughs>